Okay, can we tell how many people are have joined us yet? Yes, so they'll be fil filtering in right now. Um, so the, the number is changing. Give everyone a chance to join in. How does it look, Katie? It looks stable so far, so I think we're good to go. I will start sharing the screen. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this Rincon Island Phase Two Feasibility Study Workshop. We appreciate your joining us virtually this evening and taking time to engage with us. I'm Cindy Herzog and I'm an environmental scientist with the commission and the project manager for Phase Two. You are currently viewing all of our panelists who I'd like to introduce. Our commission staff include Michaela Weiler, commission attorney, Peter Reagan, a petroleum engineer, Kelly Connor, public land management specialist, Katie Robinson Phillip, an environmental scientist and outreach public engagement specialist, Jennifer Maddox, our tribal liaison, Jessica Ramirez, our environmental justice manager, and Diana Garcia, our student intern. Our consultant for the feasibility study is Padre and Associates. And tonight we have Simon Poulter, a principal at Padre, and Mark Steffi from Longitude 123, an engineering firm subcontracted to Padre. With that, I will turn you over to Katie. Sorry, I was unmuted. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few of the Zoom features and instructions for today. First, to limit background noise, please remain muted unless you are speaking. If you're having trouble with audio, please try calling in. During today's workshop, we will be using the Zoom polling feature and a platform called Idea Boards. When we get to this interactive part of the workshop, you will be able to provide input in several ways. One, you may raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon at the bottom of your screen, and we will call on you in the order you raise your hand. If you are calling in, you may press star nine on your keypad to raise your hand. Additionally, you can also provide input by using the chat function. The chat function is set up to only go to the panelists, um, and your input will be recorded on the idea boards when we get to that section. Katie, I hear we have, um, excuse During me, the, but I hear we have a problem with the presentation of the slides. Could you check that for us just quickly? Um, are you seeing the full, the slide of the overview of the agenda? Um, I'm being told that I'm seeing um, half the PowerPoint and half the display mode. Okay, let me switch that. There, I think that's it. Is this it. better? Sorry to interrupt you. Okay, sorry about that. I had to switch those screens. Um, okay, so now we should be seeing the overview of the agenda slide right now. Um, during the workshop today, commission staff and the consultant will provide updates on the Rincon decommissioning scope and background, as well as phase two updates. 
After each of the two presentations, we will have a few minutes for questions. Please use this time to ask, any, ask for any clarifications on the presented material you may have. You will be able to ask your questions by raising your hand and we will call on you to speak. You may not, uh, we may not be able to answer all the questions today in the interest of time, but we will provide information at the, at the end um, of today's workshop about how to stay involved and how to ask more questions. After these presentations, we will move on to the interactive part of the workshop. And finally, we will close with next steps and information about staying involved. And now I'd like to turn it over to Peter to provide an overview of the de decommissioning scope and context. All right. Uh... Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address you all today. I mean, as Cindy has kindly introduced, my name is Peter Regan. I'm uh, one of the engineering staff at the State Lands, and uh, I've put together a quick review of the history of Rincon Island, the associated onshore oil and gas leases, and the progress through to phase one to date. And uh, hopefully we should have a few minutes for questions as well at the end. So if you can uh, flip to the next slide. So uh, the, the picture here, you can see the uh, state lease areas in question. Uh, Rincon Island is contained within uh, lease 1466, artificial island with a capacity for 50 wells connected to the shore by the causeway. Uh, in the sort of top right-hand corner there, PRC 427, 429 and 430, uh, where an older set of leases developed through piers and wharfs that were abandoned, removed in 1998, and are not affected by the current operations. So uh, the next slide. PRC 410 and 145, yeah, onshore areas, which were developed by means of uh, directionally drilled wells from the onshore sites out under the ocean, which are located on a combination of state and private property just east of the Highway 101. The aerial photo that you could see shows the state's approximately six acre interest in blue there alongside the 101. This area here was once tied in submerged lands before the highway was put in and a lot of fill was brought in to raise the, the area for the highway. So these leases onshore contained 27 wells that needed to be abandoned during the course of the uh, phase one. So the next slide. So the abandonment project history Rincon Island hasn't actually commercially produced oil and gas since 2008, partly due to the condition that the uh, causeway was in. In um, 2018, the State Lands Commission issued a statement of interest for onshore and offshore well production abandonment. And 20, June 2018, sorry, uh, Drilltech was selected as the contractor to begin the abandonment programming planning September the 2018th, the sorry, September 2018, the onshore well abandonments began. And then in January 2019, the offshore well abandons began with a separate set of crews and rig. And uh, June 2021 was the planned completion of the abandonment program. Next slide. So currently in the uh, phase one. Offshore, all 50 wells are abandoned. Onshore, all 27 wells are abandoned. Um, offshore, the active wells and the con empty conductor slots, which didn't have any actual well um, production facilities installed into them, those were also abandoned. And uh, onshore, the last well was abandoned in mid-May and Projected phase one completion on target for June 2021, which is uh, in about a week. So uh, the next slide. So we have a couple of photos of the, for example, on the left there, you can see the Rincon Island well bay before the abandonment operations. Um, on the right hand side, you can see now that the wells have been abandoned. They were cemented to the surface. The, wells the wellheads were cut off 
uh, caps welded on, inspected and tested. All the piping was removed. The back wall there, which was um, supporting all the piping has also been removed. The bay has been filled in. The uh, concrete, the picture there on the right hand side, side so is the uh, concrete in the process of being installed and it's all now covered, buried and uh, nice and clean and tidy. Next slide. Some of the other island facilities which were removed, such as all the tanks and uh, processing facilities. You can see on the left there what it used to look like with during the abandonment with some cement tanks, old um, fluid storage tanks and processing facilities. Those are all now cleared and removed, as you can see in the right hand side there, which was during the process. And uh, next slide. So I have a photo of the island in September 2020 during the abandonment operations and you can, as you can see, it's a pretty busy place. There's a lot of uh, work going on, a lot of facilities, production facilities, buildings, the rig. You can see the large wall at the back there where the, the old original rig used to be supported. And uh, if you continue to the next slide, please, you'll see that now it looks considerably different. So most of the buildings have been removed. The wall, like I said, the wall was removed, the concrete's all in place over the well bay, the facilities have all been taken out and uh, it's pretty clean and tidy right now. And uh, next slide. So as well as the abandonment activities, we had to do some significant repair work on the causeway, which was in a pretty bad way. So as well as the steel piles, which are driven into the seabed that actually support the causeway, the um, I-beams between the, the main support poles were also in a pretty bad way. They were corroded. Those have all been repaired by uh, grinding out the damaged sections and mm -hmm. welding patches over the weakened sections. The pads where the causeway lands on the, the island side were also in a pretty badly corroded state. And those have been repaired with stiffener pads and the causeway is now recertified for a 60,000 pound load and able, it was obviously able to uh, help us out with the reduction in traffic, et cetera, when we were performing the abandonments. So the next slide. So the remaining phase one work, most of which since I wrote the slide is now actually complete, um, was to upgrade the security on the uh, shore side of the causeway, repair the fences, uh, install some security cameras, etc. Maintain and um, upgrade the foghorn and some of the lighting on the causeway and uh, removal of the onshore offices, which are now also uh, removed. So the next slide. So some of our Accomplishment, accomplishments, not to you know, wave our own flags, but um, we abandoned all the 77 wells successfully, 10,000 barrels of cement placed in those wells to seal them off. We upgraded the entire causeway. We removed an awful lot of tubing, pipework, and uh, steel from the island and the onshore facilities there. A lot of concrete removed from uh, both the facilities, uh, zero incidents, zero uh, environmental issues, uh, zero health and safety issues, and completed ahead of schedule and under budget. So the next slide. So up, up next, we move into phase two, which is the decommissioning feasibility study and preparation of the environmental documentation. And then once that is complete, We'll be on the final phase three, where we have worked out and decide the final disposition of the island. So if you want to next slide, please, Katie. So uh, thank you all for listening. And before I hand it off to Simon with uh, Padre to discuss the scope of the feasibility study, I think we have a quick five minute question and answer session if anyone has any questions. Yes, thank you, Peter. If you have any questions, um, please raise your Zoom hand.
You can do that at the bottom of the screen, or you can also um, click uh, star nine on your keypad. Um, and we'll call on you in the order um, that your hand is raised. And then we also had a question in the chat. I'm not sure if we wanted to take that one first or if um, any of the panelists would like to address that. And I think we need to remind uh, people that we want to keep this specific to what we're discussing today. Yes, um, so these uh, questions are just meant to be for clarification questions um, on the material. So, okay. Um, so first, I'll call on Alex Spartaro. How are you? Can you guys hear me? Yes, hello, Alex. Yes, we can hear uh, perfect, you. perfect. Thank you. As part of the feasibility study, would you be looking at the potential for making this to a green power site, a green power generation site? Is that part of what's being considered or would be considered? I think that's the kind of thing that we will be discussing um, and why we need the input from um, the public and why we're reaching out to you today is to get different ideas for what might be put into place at one time. But that's something that's currently under discussion. Okay. And where would we be submitting ideas and thoughts to where? Is there a formal place to address that? You know, at the end of this presentation, we have uh, an email that you can send things to and also going on our website. And we'll present that to you as well. And we would love to hear them. Terrific. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Our next question is from Jimmy Young. Yes, can uh, you folks hear me? Yes, yes hi, Jimmy. you can. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Jimmy Young, I'm um, a member of CFROG. I'm an advisory board member of Climate First, replacing oil and gas, and uh, was happy to be our group included, I believe 24 months ago to uh, help with phase one. Um, I have a social media piece that we created a couple of years ago that's 90 seconds long and later on perhaps I can play it but is this uh, comments for uh, Mr. Regan um, this comment period is this for each topic that floats by us and we comment on because um, I would like to ask Mr. Regan a question here yes so um, this uh, period is for any clarify clarifying questions that you may have about the material that was presented good okay so if um, my question is uh, a little bit technical in, in nature, uh, Mr. Regan, or uh, is um, I'm having trouble understanding the uh, terms like mud line and uh, I'm not an engineer. Uh, I'm, I just help with our group and um, cement line. And uh, of all the 50 wells that were capped, um, sound like brilliantly uh, at, at first blush and uh, filled with cement how far down does the cement go for those plugs of each of those? Thank you. Those are all currently capped the, the surface. Uh, the surface of the well, water? The, 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 sorry, the surface, yes, up to where the, the ground level is. The, the what level? The ground level. Ground, okay, so which is the top surface of the rocks and the cement and that photo we saw where everything's nice and smooth and flat, the concrete goes down those uh, 50 wellheads, but how far down each of those wellheads does the concrete go? I, I just wanna get a sense and our group wants to get a sense um, of how deep those concrete plugs go. The concrete plugs go from basically where the seabed would be all the way down to the, um, the the bottom of the well. Most of the wells were filled completely from heel to, to the surface with concrete. I see. So the well actually, um, if, as, if we're not getting into too much detail here, goes a certain distance below the surface of the seabed. Uh, can I say 10 feet, 20 feet, something like that? And it gets filled with concrete maybe 30 feet down for each one of those, all the way up, not just to the sea level, but up to the flat surface on top of the, the rocks. Is that roughly yeah. correct? 
you're you're talking about a few thousand feet of concrete from the seabed all the way to the bottom of the well. Oh, okay. Wow. It doesn't sound like just a plug at the top, but it no. sounds like no, no, concrete. not at all. Oh, not okay. At all. They're, most of them, where where we were able to, they were filled completely. I see the tube that goes all the way down to the furthest of its reach. Wow, that's impressive because we deal with a lot of um, um, not state agencies, but of course the uh, oil companies, the explorers, the drillers, the some on, they just will fill with obviously substandard muds and rocks and and be on their way. But uh, I'll I'll leave my comments at that point and and thank you very much. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, and then again, just as a reminder, if you um, have any other questions, we're going to move on to the next presentation. But if you have any other questions, we'll provide an email um, at the end that you'll be able to send those to. Okay, and now I'll hand it off to Simon. Thank you, Katie. Um, uh, just to start off with uh, the phase two work here is basically composed of two primary components, the feasibility study which is uh, really looking at um, how things would be done depending on what alternatives we look at. And then an environmental document, which would be basically a CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act document that would evaluate the outcome of the work that we're doing. I'm joined tonight by Mark Steffi, the founder of Longitude 123, who has uh, probably 30 years of experience in decommissioning pro projects in California his firm recently completed the grub lease uh, intake outfall structure just to the south here, as well as a number of other larger uh, decommissionings, including uh, some that we'll talk about tonight. Next slide, please. The, the feasibility study, which is really the focus of this evening, covers a couple key components, and, and Mark will get into more details. But basically, we're, we're looking at a, a variety of assessments that will be used to both educate the, the general public as well as ourselves and, and the team to uh, determine what next steps should be taken as far as the potential alternatives that we're looking at. And when it comes to alternatives, that's really the key focus. Um, next slide, please. I, I'm going to take credit for this uh, only because uh, I, 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 ha I have the mic right now. But the three R approach is something that we propose, which really looks at removal, reuse, or even potential reefing. As you can see in the in the picture here, uh, and as we showed in some of our, our previous presentations, uh, the island itself has developed quite a habitat around it, either kelp or on the rocks itself. So, you know, the reefing alternative is recognizing what is already there. Reuse, um, as you will hear from Cindy later on, certainly those ideas of what the island could potentially be reused for, as you can see in the picture here, with all the oil and gas infrastructure gone, it is a very large open space that uh, may provide uh, a place where reuse is a, a real alternative. And then finally, what we have to do is look at what would it take to remove this facility. Um, most oil and gas facilities, when they have completed their life cycle, as you heard with the wells, need to be properly removed in accordance with their lease conditions. But you know, again, that it also provides us information on what it would actually take and what potential uh, equipment would be, would be needed and, and what, if any, uh, environmental impact would occur from that. The next slide um, kind of captures in a picture where we are at right now. A feasibility study will plug into an identification of a variety of alternatives, which will then again go into a potential environmental review process. Um, so we're really focused on the really beginning of this process, a feasibility study. At this point, I'm going to turn over the mic to Mark Steffi, who's going to go into a little bit more detail on what exactly is being done as part of the feasibility study. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, the, the first part of these projects involves figuring out what's there, basically. Uh, we call it uh, desktop study and site characterization. Um, at this point, we've completed the desktop portion of this, reviewed uh, 
what's uh, what, what what records we have on how it was built and uh, uh, engineering plans, surveys that have been done. Uh, we've been involved with several uh, surveys of the, uh, the the causeway over the years and uh, gone back through those. So we've got a fairly good uh, grasp on what's been done and how it was done and what's been done be since construction up until now. Um, next slide, please. Once we, uh, well, this all leads into the, uh, creating, a, producing a project execution plan. So we're in that process now, we're developing a plan that looks at the different components and alternatives and coming up with uh, 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 basic procedures, uh, means and methods, uh, equipment, uh, scheduling, timing, durations, et cetera, uh, for uh, 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 implementing each of those uh, uh, solutions for the components. So that way uh, we've got the information we need to judge uh, and make decisions on uh, uh, the, the budgetary questions and so forth. Um, let me see here. Let's go ahead and do the flyby next part of the site characterization. If you could change the slide 23. Part of the site characterization involves uh, quite a bit of survey. So we've done extensive multi-beam sonar survey of the seafloor from the shoreline out uh, about a thousand feet past the island, as well as a laser or LIDAR of the uh, terrestrial side of it. And then we've combined them both into uh, kind of a flyby video, just to give you some idea how extensive the survey is. Are we gonna play that now? I'm switching screens now. Okay. Oop, there we go. Okay. So this is kind of a flyby, but it shows uh, underwater surface features, uh, features on the seafloor and above the seafloor up to the water surface. And then the LIDAR is uh, added to this to, to give us the uh, above water features. The uh, both, uh, both survey methodologies produce uh, point clouds. So every object has, uh, is identified or characterized by a series of, of uh, electronic points, if you will. And we can zoom in on any feature above water or underwater on the seafloor and uh, look at that point cloud. And pretty well, that sound paints a picture of the objects uh, underwater, on the underwater side of it. And we can uh, get an idea of, of what, uh, what those objects or features are. Just a second here, we'll get alongside the causeway. It's probably got the most detail in this video but we have the, the same level of information throughout the entire survey site. And coming up here. Now there's gaps here in these piling. That doesn't mean the piling's missing. That's the interface between the sound part, the sonar part and the LIDAR. So right at the splash zone where the sonar can't reach and the LIDAR can't see, there's a, 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 a bit of a gap. This is, this is fairly zoomed out, but we can zoom in right up to a, say a four foot by four foot object and then move around that 360 degrees to see exactly what it is and sizes are and so forth. And then we can do uh, engineering with that information. It gives us the specifics on the, the uh, geometry of the, the, the various components. Take measurements and so forth. And all that's used to help us plan. Once we know what's there, then we can plan accurately. And that's it's really important to know what's there because if you don't and you plan inaccurately, it can lead to major changes later in the project.
And I think that's it. And the, the next slide is a uh, another uh, part. Let's see, keep going, keep going. One more, catch us up. There we go, coastal engineering study. So this is also part of the uh, engineering uh, studies done to support the planning. We need to know uh, what's uh, what 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 the conditions are uh, in the marine side of this thing, and uh, those that information then comes uh, into play when we start talking about things like uh, if we remove the uh, the causeway and remove the groin, what would the effect be on the the beach around that area? So we'd want to know that as best we could. Uh, before plans are made, and that happens in the coastal engineering study. Cool. And then next slide. And finally, uh, we're developing uh, uh, an engineering assessment with uh, uh, a cost and schedule for the various options and components. So uh, there'll be a kind of a, 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 a menu, if you will, of, well, if we did this or we did that, or we removed this, but left that, uh, what would be involved? What would happen first? What would happen second? What would the cost be? And uh, we're producing that right now. And I think that's it for me, Simon, back to you. Thanks, Mark. Um, I, I, I find the imagery that uh, has been Produced through the uh, lidar and the uh, and the uh, hydrographic surveys that have been done, an incredible tool for all of us. We can actually see what's going on. Um, I think uh, as a result of that, we can see that the island is holding together very nicely through its uh, history. We don't see a lot of uh, rock coming off the uh, island. Also, the coastal processes studies is indicating, you know, that the island is capable of handling. Uh, anticipated storms and uh, also sea level rise, was, uh, which is obviously something that may impact the potential reuse of the island over time. One of the other issues that we are looking at is also has the historic oil and gas operations resulted in any contamination out on the island uh, and also in the onshore facility. And so we are currently doing assessment out there uh, to look at both soil and at least in the island interstitial water uh, that is inside the island itself to see if, uh, if there is any contamination that comes into play in regarding to the planning of, of, of the uh, reuse of the island or taking it out so that you can uh, calculate the cost of, of, of de dealing with any contamination. Um, next slide, please. The final part of this um, presentation on our part really is a, a visualization of what we have been talking about. As you can see by following this flow diagram that we are completing um, basically a series of engineering and environmental studies that will help support uh, the development of an engineering package that will allow the evaluation of alternatives. Although many people may like to do something particular with the island, uh, some of these studies may indicate that there are limitations that may need to come into play. Um, as Peter indicated, obviously there have been substantial repairs to the causeway and those have to be factored into any potential reuse alternative um, considering the, uh, um, the need to, to possibly repair the causeway again in the future. So right now we really are looking for, you know, getting to the point where we are preparing project alternatives that would be then moved forward into the next phase, uh, which would be the environmental work. So I'll turn it back to Cindy to kind of talk through the last part of our, our presentation today. Actually, I think Katie is going to do our exercises. <laughs> so I'll let you go, Katie. Yes, thank you. And then um, just before we go into the interactive exercises, we do, do have a couple of um, minutes in case there are any um, clarifying questions that needed to be asked about the presentation that both Simon and Mark gave. So um, if you would like to ask any, again, um, any clarifying questions, please raise your Zoom hand um, and we will call on you. We'll have about five minutes and then we'll move back um, to the interactive exercises. Again, if we can't get to your questions, um, we'll provide you with an email that you'll be able to 
um, submit those questions too. Okay, um, our first hand um, is Jimmy Young. Thank you. Um, can I be heard now? Yes, yes Jimmy. Jimmy, we can hear you. Great, you never know. <laughs> so um, in, in regards to uh, uh, Simon and Mark, I'm sorry, I didn't write your last names down. Are you, you both with Padre and Associates? Um, Mark is with Longitude 123 and I'm with Padre. Got it. And um, just a point of a clarification. And um, Simon, was it you that just said that the next phase um, is contamination assessment um, to determine the level of contamination on the island and below the island? Or um, is, is that contamination assessment level been um, conducted already? It's ongoing right now. We are actually in the process of doing that assessment. I see. And, and how long do you anticipate, uh, assuming no uh, bad um, contaminants are found, I imagine there's gotta be some, um, how long do you anticipate that coming phase uh, to last? Um, we are working towards completing all the engineering and, and assessment work uh, in the next two, been in about two months uh, at this point. We expect to have uh, preliminary documents completed by then uh, for the state to start reviewing. About mid-August then? Yes. I see, well, the okay. The document itself, the feasibility study, that will take a little bit longer to Certainly, but, but the uh, contamination uh, assessment, perhaps about that long. Okay, thank you, that's all I had. I think we have some questions in chat, Katie. Yes, um, would uh, you or Michaela or um, Peter or Simon like to answer any of those? Now, I cannot see them. Maybe you can read them out for me. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so we have one question from um, Alex Farataro. Uh, how long do you anticipate the feasibility study will take? Can we? We sort of answered that with Simon. It was at the beginning of the six months and Simon, to, uh, to an actual draft feasibility study, when do you think that will be ready? Uh, we're expecting after we've completed all the individual studies and, and get that all compiled, we'll, we're looking at probably the end of the third quarter this year um, that we'll have a draft ready, at least for the, the state to review. And then once we've received their comments, that will then be uh, have made us, you know, made it available to, to the public. Right. And I should add that at that time, after that draft feasibility study is released, uh, we will be having another meeting that we can uh, get some input from the public yet again. Yeah. Um, and then there is one question about um, the chat question. So currently all of the chat is going, is only viewable to the panelists. Um, we have another question about um, let's see, the question is you're estimating, and this is from Dan Riddick, you're oh, estimating the cost of these studies. What is the expected date of completion and can the public get a copy of the information that's gathered? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part of that, Katie. Um, so it's a question regarding the studies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, um, so we've been estimating the cost of the studies. What is the expected date of completion of these studies? And then can the public get a copy of this information? Okay, again, I, I think we had said that the studies themselves will probably be completed around August, uh, but uh, the feasibility study, the draft version of the feasibility study will likely uh, not be ready until after the third quarter of this year. And we will be releasing that for public review at that time. And you will be notified of that. So you'll have a chance again to, to comment on the document. Thank you. And then I believe Michaela will take this next question. Um, the question is from Dan Riddick. And um, it is, I understand there is an oil well or wells between Muscle Shores, most Muscle Shoals and Welcomechita near shore, um, plus or minus uh, 50 to 300 feet offshore. I understand these wells were linked to Rincon Island. What is the status of these wells? Or are there no wells as I have described? Yeah, Katie, um, I can touch on that. 
Uh, the commission is aware of another well, it's well 102 um, offshore in or around the location described in the question. Um, that was not addressed as part of this project um, for a variety of reasons, um, but it is on the commission's radar and it's um, possible and probably likely it will be addressed um, as part of a future project, probably under the SB44 program. Um, that well, because of its location, required completely different um, equipment and um, approaches than the wells that were abandoned onshore and on the island. Um, and it also entail quite um, a bit of money to take care of that additional well. But we are aware of it um, and will remain aware of it. Thank you, Michaela. Um, and then we also had a question from John Brooks. Um, could you repeat the name of our of your tribal consultant and have you involved members or elders of the Barbarino, Fran Torino Band of Mission Indians? Perhaps this area is a part of their history. And so um, uh, um, earlier we introduced the members of our staff that are on this call and our, um, our tribal liaison is Jennifer Maddox. Um, and she's um, one of the staff on this call. And I just ask if she would like to um, you know, say anything about this, uh, this comment, we have uh, conducted outreach um, and sent information about, um, about the Rincon decommissioning efforts. Um, sure, I can um, just, I'm looking at this now. So thanks for your question, John. Um, I, yeah, we have reached out uh, initially. I, did, I reached out via email for this, um, workshop, and then now that this has been sort of the basic information, then we'll be continuing that and sending an invitation to consult once we have the feasibility study ready. Um, so this is just the first step. And yes, the uh, the Barbarania Ventrania Band of Mission Indians, um, we have several people there that we contact, including the chair. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, we have uh, one more question in the chat um, and then we might have to move on to the interactive portions to make sure that we get through those. Um, the question is, we've seen before and after pictures, is it possible to have information regarding the remaining infrastructures on the island? Simon, can you take that one? I think you're muted. Yep, sorry. I think I'm gonna have to defer to Peter on that one. Oh, okay, sorry. I mean, mo all, most all of the oil and gas related infrastructures have been removed. There's one office building, small office building left out there and uh, electricity, water supply, that's about it. Everything else, the pipelines, et cetera, have been removed. Thank you, Peter. Um, so right now we're going to move on to the interactive portion so that we make sure that we have enough time to gather all the input and ideas and um, great comments that you have regarding a few questions. Um, so, um, but do keep in mind your questions. If you still have some, we'll provide an email at the end where you'll be able to submit those. And now let me transition screens a bit. Um, for our first uh, question, uh, this question relates back to the um, feasibility scope um, and we'll be asking two uh, questions using the poll feature on Zoom. Um, and so um, for the first poll, we would like to know which alternatives you think should be analyzed for Rincon Island. And these alternatives include removal, which is the complete removal of the island and causeway, remediation and restoration of the onshore property, reuse, retention of the island, repair of the causeway for long-term access, remediation and restoration of the onshore property, and then reefing, which would be the retention of the island, removal of the causeway, um, the vessel-based access, remediation and restoration of the onshore property. So I'm going to start the poll. 
Um, and please um, just select the options um, that you think uh, should be analyzed. And you should see the poll now. And we'll just give this a minute for um, everyone to, um, to put in their answers and then we'll go to the second question. Okay, I'm not seeing too many more trickle in, so we'll give it another couple of seconds just to make sure everyone had a chance to put in their answers. All right, I think that's it. So I will end this question now. And for the second uh, poll question that we'd like to ask, um, so for the second poll, we'd like to know which alternatives, um, oops, sorry, let me change the slide so you can see it that way too. Um, we would like to know which alternatives should be um, analyzed for the Rincon, on, Rincon onshore facility site. Um, these alternatives include leaving the area fenced off and not utilized, um, using the area's re active recreation, such as a park or RV park, using the area for passive recreation, such as access points or parking for a nearby beach, or consider working with the county on another land use. And I will launch the polling now. And again, please um, click uh, multiple choices, um, as many other choices that you would like to um, see be analyzed. Okay, I'm not seeing any more trickling in. So I will end this polling and we will go to our idea boards exercise. And I just need a few moments to do a screen share switch. And then we'd also um, just like to note that this is, you know, an initial gathering of information. Um, you know, please feel free to send us uh, your ideas um, uh, on these alternatives um, in the email address that we'll provide at the end as well. This is not a one-time opportunity to provide comment or um, um, provide ideas. Um, so now I'm sharing an idea boards and what we'll do is we'll focus on one question at a time and um, we'll have time to uh, gather your ideas and comments and input on each question and I'll zoom in so everyone is able to see the screen. And so we'll be going to question three first and let me zoom in. I know that this is a little hard to read. Um, um, so for the idea, uh, idea boards exercise, 
For this, we'll be asking three questions about considerations that should be taken into account for the feasibility scope. And then we'll also ask questions about the long-term use of Rincon Island and the onshore facility sites. And we would like to hear thoughts and ideas on all three questions. We will share the um, idea boards um, on the screen as I am now. Um, and if you would like to provide um, an idea or thought, um, please raise your Zoom hand or press star nine if you're calling in. Uh, we will call on you in the order in which you have raised your hand. And then you will then have about three minutes to present your idea or input. Um, your idea or comment will be transcribed on the idea boards by Diana, our student intern. And then you may also submit your idea or comment in the chat. The chat is again um, set up only so that is viewable to the panelists. The comments that are sent to the chat will be transcribed into the idea boards. For the first question, um, we would like to hear from you about what considerations, for example, noise, emissions, traffic, marine impacts, increased activity. Um, so what considerations such as these should be taken into account as we evaluate the range of options for both the island and the onshore facility site. And so if you would like to provide an idea um, and provide input on this question, please raise your Zoom hand now and I will begin to call on you um, in the order in which you raise your hand and Diana will transcribe your idea on the board so that all can see. Um, for our first uh, prompter, we have Pamela Warden. Yes, you can hear me at this point? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Pamela. Okay. Um, Yes, I, question three um, is all of those should be under consideration. I want to say that I have been in Muscle Shoals for 50 years as a homeowner. The only other person I recognize who was speaking today was Dan Reddick. Those other people, I don't know who they are, but they don't live in our community. And the impact that you're going to make on our community, you have no idea when the surf is high, the impact we have of trying to get in and out, trying to do things in our community. and having children be safe as they walk down the street to get to the beach. It is a very unsafe situation, let alone if you, you have to consider the uh, one thing that you don't have here is safety. And so you should add that noise, yes, emissions, yes, traffic, yes, and safety, because safety is uh, what we are having already issues with that we've been working with the county on. And so anything that you would do would uh, we want you to consider that and realize that we are a neighborhood. This is our home. Um, so please think about that when you're doing something. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for our next commenter, we have Alex Bataru. Hi, thank you. Um, I would like to suggest, uh, by the way, I think all these considerations are excellent. One of the things that I would like to suggest to be added is visual impact, okay? And uh, one of the things should also be considered is what impact it has on the marine, uh, in depth study in terms of the marine life, how it might be affected uh, if uh, some serious large construction work is done or some demolition work is done in and around uh, Rincon Island. Um, it's um, a facility like this one can also be, doesn't have to be a liability, can also be an asset. And uh, the consideration that I'd like to see be taken into account is how can this be turned into an environmental asset rather than an environmental liability? Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. And then just a note to everyone attending, um, there's a little bit of a delay in seeing your comments um, uh, being transcribed on the idea boards. So please know that we are taking them down and they, they will be up there. There's just a little bit of a delay. Okay, um, for our next uh, commenter, we have Jimmy Young. Yes, thank you. You can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you, Jimmy. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, the gentleman just spoke, uh, excellent, and I did not get the citizen's name, uh, uh, ma'am, that you uh, spoke. Your, uh, you, you folks live there, your children live there. Uh, this, um, 
create this giant, I, I want to call it a monstrosity because and sometimes it's, it's a love hate relationship over the decades. And I fully get how some people look out there and will bless the day uh, when um, it, it is either gone or, or severely changed in a more natural and safe uh, way, certainly. Uh, the residents, I think, rate tops because they're, they're the closest and they dealt with the trucks and, and the dangerous situations. Uh, I, I don't represent Seafrog's opinion, but at this point, as an advisory board member, and I can tell you I've spoken to many of our uh, supporters and our, um, our staff, that we want to see um, a, a, a re reefing, a reefing of the situation, get rid of the causeway, um, make it safe and clean for the local residents to be able to walk on their beaches again, uh, but certainly uh, bring in the opinions of our, um, our wonderful Chumash um, citizens who were here first and um, would certainly love to hear more from Mrs. Maddox in the future, Jennifer, um, um, Seafrog would like to reach out to you and have private conversations about um, um, what would what would touch the hearts of, of our Chumash neighbors to bring it much more to a natural, um, culturally acceptable solution. Uh, my prejudices say, let's get it back to a natural uh, environment, get rid of everything that you see that steal uh, some of us think it should be, I'm, I'm not Chumash, but I identify with our, our Chumash brethren and uh, a Chumash heritage and wildlife sanctuary. Um, let them choose what plants, what flora, what flana, should it be a natural rookery? Uh, just because I vote for that, um, get rid of the causeway that's get rid of no parking out there for people you have to walk if you want to walk close to it and and see the uh the wildlife out there if you're brave enough to take a kayak out park in a designated place away from the neighbors and come in at it a certain way and um anyhow i i i say let's let's open it up to the people that are the closest and the people who um inhabited this lands for tens of thousands of years before we allowed the oil companies to come in and scar it as such Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Marisa Sullivan. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Marisa Sullivan. I'm the tribal chair for the coastal band of the Chumash Nation. Um, Thank you. I'd, I'd like to thank Jimmy Young for bringing up and being so passionate about making sure that our voice is heard here. Um, and I also would like to thank Jennifer Maddox, who always uh, is always including us in, in things, and I, I appreciate that. Um, a couple of things that come to my mind is, number one, and I grew up here in this area, uh, the Rincon Island area and the people who live in Muscle Shoals have always, you know, it's a little pocket of a, of a community. Um, and I think we all know about some of the really terrible, tragic, uh, tra you know, traffic things, you know, that's just kind of what comes to my mind of people trying to get into the Muscle Shoals area. And I can only see that it'll turn into a nightmare if for them and, and anybody else who's driving to access what if it turns into some kind of recreational um, place. Um, and I'll, t I, you know, I'll tell you my husband who is a sport fisherman and loves to take a boat out and loves fishing and respects everything out there and including the Enchano Islands, he spends a lot of time out there. Um, immediately he was like, oh yeah, it'd be great to be able to take a boat up <laughs> out there. And I'm like, yeah, that's not a good idea. I mean, you can't just start having that be, a place of destination because I just, I just think it's going to get wrecked. I mean, uh, yeah. Um, my concern, I suppose my, my, I would really encourage in this process and it's going to be a while that, um, I guess I would like to see that it was restored to its natural state. If that's at all possible. Uh, I understand there's a lot that would have to be removed and I guess there's, you know, things have been capped already, um, but 
yeah, it's such, such a daunting thing to, to look at it and, and think that people are going to now be trying to access it and even having their own personal parties um, because they can. Um, I've already seen some things online of some of the some conservancies that already are planning to have events because of course it would be a marquee area, wouldn't it? To have something out there and it's, it, it would be beautiful. I would love to be able to walk out there and just stand there and look at everything in the ocean. Um, so I think that, that part of the issue I have is when any coastal access is um, closed off in any way. So I, you know, I, and I think that the land that we're looking at that's over, over by the railroad tracks, I actually think that there should be a serious consideration of giving that land to uh, the natives and the Shumash people and, and just giving it to them and let them have that piece of land. So that's just, it's just my opinion. I think we should be giving land back anytime we can. <laughs> so thank you. I'm looking forward to you know seeing how things play out here for everybody, and I hope I know not everyone's going to be happy, but um, I think if we all keep in mind that we're all about the ocean and we want to protect what we have, and as best we can, that is our responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I would like to note that there is a, a word limit um, on some of our comment bubbles, but we um, uh, we are recording this. And so um, please know that we will have the full ideas. We might have to transcribe it so that it's a little bit more brief for the purposes of sharing this screen, but we do have the full ideas and we really appreciate all of these comments. Um, for our next speaker, um, Dan Riddick. Um, Dan, you might have to unmute yourself. Thank you. So I just want to thank all of you so much for putting in all of this effort and time and energy to really understand all of the issues that lie before us, not only as the, uh, the residents of Muscle Shoals, but also the greater community that surround the area. Um, I, I do want to make sure that it is emphasized that I do have concerns about one, um, there are other oil wells between us and, and Lock and Cheetah, and I understand that it was uh, uh, brought up and, and uh, basically um, thought that maybe we'll deal with that, that at the next phase, but my concern is we have a lot of oil on the beach. I believe it's from those wells, and I think it should be part of this process. Uh, the second thing is it would be really nice if the uh, if the uh, community understands the cost benefit of, you know, removing the island, like how are decisions being made regarding the, 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 the price of something versus the benefit to not only the residents of Muscle Shoals, but also the greater community. Um, your process that you're doing, I, I tell you, I, I can't think of a way that I might have managed them differently, but it is pretty quick and that you're asking us to really respond to verse, you know, like, voting schedules and so forth. You're doing a great job. I get why you're doing it. Um, but man, this is really fast. And I don't know if as a community, both near, which is within Muscle Shoals or the greater community are able to really digest everything that you've thrown out tonight, which is great. It's been well thought through. Nonetheless, to ask for a vote within the 15 minutes of understanding what you're doing is pretty tight. Um, Jimmy and uh, my wife is a uh, Paiute Indian, um, and I apologize, I can't remember the last speaker, but this is a natural state. I think it needs to be considered. My wife, like I said, she's Paiute Indian, um, and we have the Chumash Indian. I think you really need to take what Jimmy, and I, I apologize, I can't remember the last speaker's point of view is, is that, uh, um, you know, you really need to think about the impact on the environment, um, in everything that happens through this process. Other than that, we thank you. You guys are, are doing a great job and uh, happy to be a part of this process. Thank you, Dan. All right, 
Um, so we will move on to the second question now. Um, and then again, I would just like to iterate, um, this won't be the only opportunity. Um, if you have additional ideas um, that come up afterwards, um, you know, a, a brainstorm moment after this, um, we really do welcome you to send those ideas and comments um, to the email address that we'll have at the end. Okay, and let me now transition to the second question, or well, to the fourth question for today. Okay. So for this fourth question, um, we'd like to hear your thoughts on what long-term use could you envision for the island or onshore facility sites? And then when you provide your input, please indicate if you're referring to the island, the onshore site, or both sites. Um, and then if you would like to um, verbally provide uh, comments or ideas um, pertaining to this question, please raise your Zoom hand now. Additionally, you can also submit them in the chat. And um, just like what we did with the last question, we will transcribe um, so that everyone can see. Okay. Um, our first speaker, we have Jeff uh, Mossen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jeff. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm a commercial fisherman in Santa Barbara. My name is Jeff Mawson. Um, I thank you all for your efforts and your hard work in this. Um, I did provide public comment in writing over the last week. I hope you saw that, had a chance to see that and digest that. Uh, I just wanted to point out that to me, um, Rincon Island, as a recreational fisherman going back 45 years here, and a commercial fisherman, I think that um, the island is a treasure that the people of the state of California um, uh, own and should be um, admired and appreciated and understood for the ecosystem services that it provides. Um, the island itself is placed in an area where there is sand flats. There's very little that survives outside of the island in the riprap um, that was put there. Yes, it's artificial, but um, the ecosystem services are plentiful. And I could say that from a personal standpoint, having dove it maybe 80 to 100 times over the last 25 years. Um, uh, what I would like to envision to get back to the point <clears throat> is things are moving pretty fast in the form of aquaculture and system uh, ecosystem services and uh, uh, oceanic health and regeneration. <clears throat> given um, the climate problems we're having now. Global warming, sea level rise, uh, uh, ocean uh, temperature increases are causing huge effects on ecosystems. And what I would like to see as a citizen of the state is I would like to see that utilized to the highest possible degree uh, because it is a very unique structure and it has the potential to provide services uh, for aquaculture for regeneration of um, invertebrate uh, fish, maybe, and as we're um, and uh, in, inverts um, and mollusks, um, and every all of this stuff is being impacted pretty profoundly given our uncertain climatic conditions. So, um, secondly, uh, another purpose for the island would be to grow kelp, to plant kelp along the near shore ecosystem to protect the freeway and the houses along Sea Cliff and Sandy Land and um, the Rincon. So it would be a great facility to utilize for protecting our, eco, our, our uh, infrastructure that we all use. Uh, thirdly, I see sport and recreational uses um, and uh, the intrinsic value of having strong ecosystem services of organisms that live within the rocks and swim out and um, can help to uh, thwart the effects of climate change and um, the stressors. And then lastly, I wanted to address the onshore facility site. Um, I, I would, you know, I, I think we have enough tourist uh, attractions in the area. Um, I, I think that the highest possible use of the onshore might be supporting aquaculture, growing food, and um, uh, maybe drying of kelp, uh, perhaps to use as biochar, as alternative energy fuels, and possibly even re-injecting it into the wells and sequestering the carbon from what could be grown along that stretch of coast there. And um, 
I'd like to really strongly encourage the state lands to be on the forefront of these new technologies that are knocking on our door, rather than uh, having to drive to Ensenada or Mexico and see what's going on down there, um, which is truly profoundly groundbreaking. And, and lastly, I just wanted to wind up that I understand the NGOs are interested in the island. And what I wanted to ask of you and beseech you to save it for the people of the state, the local commercial fishermen, the local sport divers and sport fishermen, and those people that might and uh, uh, those people that might enjoy those facilities um, uh, from a that are taxpayers within the community and that could have the highest possible enjoyment out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next uh, commenter is Alex Spataro. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, totally support the comments that were made earlier. I would also like to add that this uh, island offers the potential to be at the forefront of cl demonstrating climate change technologies that are environmentally friendly. Uh, one of those technologies is uh, kite-based energy harvesting which is of a temporary nature that doesn't, you don't have to put on a big power tower. You don't have to do major uh, drilling you have to, uh, to create a foundation. Everything that you need to do this, it's already there. And it can actually dovetail nicely with what the state is trying to do with offshore wind energy harvesting, but in a non-destructive environmentally friendly fashion that is based on technology that is already developed to do such a technology demonstration, temporary project would be, uh, it's a very fortunate site to do so. So um, fighting climate change is our global responsibility. We are all a part of it. And anything that we can do to move forward in that regard, I think we have a responsibility as a citizens of the world to do so. It's not just a local issue, it's a world issue. And that particular site can be used for such purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any other commenters on this question before we move on to the fifth and final question? Oh, yes. Um, for our next speaker, we have Jimmy. Um, I was just a commenter, um, not a speaker, but. Um, thank you. Yes, I, I uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jimmy. Thank yeah, you. I, I fully um, agree with uh, everything that Alex uh, just said and um, Jeff Mosen as well. Um, even though I'm uh, advisory board member of, of Climate First, replacing oil and gas, I've also uh, treasure our uh, natural state uh, ocean, aquaculture and, and um, the sport and recreational aspects of, of what we, we have right out our, our front doors, our back doors. Um, again, being uh, very mindful of the local residents there, uh, traffic upon their, their, their dangerous streets. I've been there many times. I was, Sea Frog was invited to uh, tour the facility um, in 218 or perhaps it was 219 from, uh, with, by the state we were invited and uh, before this is over, I'd like to share a link for a 90 second piece we did. Um, but um, I believe, in my opinion, I, um, since I'm only one vote as a citizen, but I think everything I've heard so far, and, and again, from the previous gentleman before Jeff, um, I, I do also feel an undue urgency that's been placed upon us, the community. Um, I also appreciate the, the engineering uh, prowess of to map underwater above water and the fact that um, um, we're doing what the oil companies should have done and we paid for it. And um, although I appreciate it, I also feel an undue pressure with the time uh, schedule to make sure that we can reach out um, to in a, in a more significant way to take this wonderful infrastructure you're sharing with us over Zoom with all the boards and so on, but um, get some outside agencies like Sea Frog and um, uh, citizen groups, um, the Chumash people um, to, to work this system a little better than it's being worked. It's very impressive 
organizational and you guys spoke it, uh, doing a great job i agree but uh we need to perhaps slow parts of it down and um keep speeding up the parts that you folks have been doing cleaning it up capping it making it safe and uh, let's reach out a little uh, better though to some very important organizations that aren't sharing this today and, and let's perhaps phase uh, make this next one. Uh, we can help get the word out if you uh, come to us at Seafrog. We'll help get um, more involvement uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, one more person um, to provide input and then we'll move on to the fifth question to make sure that we have time for that. Um, our next uh, commenter is Pamela Warden. Um, she disappeared, sorry, <laughs> one moment. Okay, Pamela, uh, you can unmute yourself unmute. now. Now, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I presume yes. you can. Thank you. Um, I wanna say that I love the island. I love looking out at the island. So I'm not for removing the island, but I'm only one house of 55 and Dan spoke and he's a second house. And there are 53 other houses with one or more people living there. And I haven't heard from any of them. I did send this notice out. I don't feel we're getting, we're talking about reaching out to people who don't live right near there. And we're not reaching out to the people who do live there. If you want these questions answered and you want voices on this, send it out in the US mail and ask them their opinion. Um, but you're not doing that. And Zoom, I'm sorry, Zoom is not the best communicator that ever came along. So um, I, I do think we need to reach out, but I would like to reach out to the neighborhood first and have our neighbors be able to do this. By the way, some people do not have internet. They can't always get phone service there. there there's two limits. We have limited phone service and limited internet access there because of the location that we are. So you can't always do things on Zoom. If we're done with this COVID, maybe we should have a meeting, a real meeting and see what people are saying. But um, I do want you to know that I do love the island. I'm not proposing that we get rid of the island, but I'm only one. And I certainly would like to hear from the other 53 houses in our community as to what we think we should be looking out on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, whoops. All right, I'm going to transition to the fifth and final question for this exercise. Okay. So for this last question, um, we would like to hear your thoughts um, and input on what you do not want to see happen to Rincon Island. Um, again, um, if you would like to verbally submit your idea, uh, please raise your Zoom hand um, or press star nine if you're calling in. Um, and additionally, you can also submit um, your ideas and input through the chat. And we will do our best to transcribe. Um, there is a word limit, but that's, um, we'll do our best to briefly transcribe it and then uh, we will still have the full um, idea in our records and notes. Okay, for our first commenter, we have Alex Bataro. Thank you. What I would like I would like to see happen, not happen to Rincon Island. I would like I would like to have it go on. I'd like I'd hate to have it removed. It's a beautiful place. It's a treasure of the coast, and I understand that it wasn't there to begin with, but it's there now. It's beautiful and. Uh, it can serve for all kinds of good purposes. Let's not just think uh, what was in the past. Let's think what we can do in the future with what we got. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is a little bit of a delay as these comments get added um, to this board for all to see. Um, do we have any um, anyone else who would like to raise their hand and comment? Um, Jimmy? Jimmy Young? Yes, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, please, let's not allow this to turn into a tourist trap. Let's uh, create an homage to our natural environment, the safety of our local residents, 
the uh, longest term inhabitants, the the Shumash. Uh, let let's 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 rejoice uh, in the removal of what has been there, allowed to be there, and and go forward in a very more measured way, uh, and um, keep it as a treasure, but refine it and using the input of our local neighbors and our local citizens. And uh, we're just so grateful that it's it's not an oil infrastructure anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Our next commenter is Pamela Warden. I'm sorry, because I, I shouldn't be speaking so much, but my neighbors don't either are not raising their hand or aren't listening. Um, and can't get in. I don't want to see that as a party boat. I don't want a party situation there. So I agree, a tourist trap, it is already a tourist trap. I wish I had a dime for every time they ask me what that island is. And if I just do that, I could retire wealthy. Um, but uh, I'm just joking. Um, but don't make it a party place or a place where you lease it out to um, people who are going to bring a helicopter pad in or any of that kind of thing. That's what I wouldn't want to see uh, because that would impact our neighborhood tremendously, both the helicopter pad and or um, transporting people out there uh, for big parties or that kind of thing. So please just keep in mind that it is a neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. For our next commenter, uh, commenter, we have Jose Bacalo. Good afternoon. Thanks for hosting this workshop tonight. I appreciate it. I've made some comments on the chat for all of you, but I just want to reiterate also that I do not want to see public access to the island, regardless of what happens to the island. Um, and I do not want to see any public use on the island. If, we, if anything, we can restore it its beauty and uh, keep it natural. Thank you very much. Thank you. For our next commenter, we have Dan Reddick. Dan, you'll have to unmute yourself. Hey guys, so hey, my only comment is that this is really kind of a fast paced method of getting public feedback and that I hope that there will be uh, an open forum that will allow us to digest what you provided us all tonight um, as a community within Muscle Shoals, which is, um, you know, we kind of need to fall back and look at what you presented and hope that there is a waiting period between this meeting and any further action as it relates to the direction of the feasibility study. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Do you have anyone else that would like to um, provide ideas or input um, on this question before we go to next steps and how to stay involved. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised at the moment. Again, I would just like to reiterate that um, at the end we will um, provide an email address and we, um, we really do welcome you to this and any ideas that come up, um, any other questions that this presentation might have sparked. Um, you know, uh, we want to hear from you. So, um, uh, so please uh, send us uh, send us your questions and ideas, and we'll go over that in a few slides. Okay, I will transition from the screen now. Um, just one moment, please. So um, before I, sorry. Um, so first I'd like to thank you all for your comments and your ideas and for your questions. And before I hand this off to Cindy to provide closing remarks, I'd like to discuss a few ways that you can stay involved. 
Um, so um, you, uh, one of the ways that you can stay involved is we do have an email address. You can submit questions or other ideas to our email at rincon.phase2 at slc.ca.gov. Additionally, um, you may also check out our website for the latest updates. Um, on our website, there is additional background about the RINCON decommissioning efforts and a frequently asked questions and answer sheet. Um, and so those are some of the ways to stay involved. We will be continuing our outreach and engagement efforts. Um, if there are people here, uh, or, uh, if there are people that were not here um, tonight that you think should be reflected um, in case we don't have their contact information, please do send us um, uh, send us that information. That way we can make sure to include them on um, upcoming outreach efforts. And now I will turn it back to Cindy. Thank you all. Well, let me add uh, my thank you to Katie's that for everyone who made comments this evening, we really appreciate all of the input that you've given us. And uh, we'll certainly talk internally about trying to uh, delay the process a little bit to give you more time to think about things. And, uh, and also, um, Pamela, great idea to uh, address all of the neighborhood separately and get their input. That's, that's great. So um, we do appreciate you participating in the workshop. As I said, very important. And I also want to acknowledge and thank the involved tribes and our local and state and federal agency partners, including Ventura County. I don't know if we had anyone um, on this workshop tonight, but if you're out there, thank you. Uh, we are recording this meeting and we will place the link to the recording along with the PowerPoint presentation on our website. Uh, so you can go and find that there. I don't know exactly when it will be up, but most likely tomorrow. Um, please be on the lookout for notices from us or additional opportunities to engage with us on this um, phase two process and provide your insights, perspectives, ideas, and your concerns, all things that we truly want to hear. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Okay, I will stop the recording now and I will end the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Katie.